So good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to begin by thanking Heather for what she has wrought. <laughs> uh, so yes, I have been very impressed uh, how far we have gone in one year um, in beginning to understand some of the concepts that I was fortunate enough to bring to you last year. And people credit me uh, with the research and the concept a lot, but I do uh, want you to know that the concept actually came from the entrepreneurs themselves. Um, uh, I have been more a student than anything else and the scribe, if you will. But it is wonderful what that role of being student and scribe has enabled for me. Um, I also want to thank uh, Sarah Wiffen, who has worked very hard with me on taking some of these concepts and actually bringing it into the world in a way that people don't have to deal with words like effectuation to understand it, but also to really think through different ways uh, to create workshops and teaching materials. There have also been other educators, uh, including some people in the room, um, and Heather, uh, bringing, uh, writing case studies, bringing up examples and things like that. So I'm the beneficiary of a lot of people, uh, and uh, I just, you know, take credit and come along for the ride. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and enabling me to do the master class yesterday as well. Um, so just to get started, as I mentioned, I have been um, a student uh, of entrepreneurial expertise over the last 15 years, really trying to understand what is it that people learn in the trenches when they do multiple enterprises and spend their entire life building uh, ventures and creating value. And along the way, they also fail. They also experience heartache. And the issue is to think through what is it that they learn the hard way from the trenches that we can also learn and teach. And the result of that is this word called effectuation. Um, so since many of you in the room uh, all, are already familiar with the concept, but I also want to acknowledge that there are people in the room who may never have heard of this ugly word before in their life. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes to tell you what it is and give you a short overview. And the overview can be short, uh, thanks to uh, Heather's talk yesterday, and I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, so simply put, right, when you think about what is effectuation, um, it's basically saying work with what's already within your control, right? So it's not all about chasing resources all the time. You have more resources than you think you have. And what do you do with that? You actually co-create the future. And the future can be your future, the future of people you love, the communities you live in, or the future of the universe, you know, <laughs> the future of the species, the future of the world. Um, and you can see that over a period of time, we have done this research not only with the expert entrepreneurs that I studied for my dissertation, but we went out and uh, looked at hundreds of companies in different parts of the world, different demographics, um, uh, uh, people even in you know, 18th century onwards. And so there are about 40 researchers who have worked in this area, and they developed lots of empirical understanding of the field as well. So everything I say, once again, uh, comes from a lot of other people. I just give you a subset of some of the case histories we wrote of companies where you can actually see evidence uh, of the principle of principles of effectuation. So just to remind ourselves, right, this is simply the idea that you can work with things within your control to co-create the future. The question really is, and the interesting part of the research is how. Uh, and the how we found is embodied in five different principles that you ha already have heard of um, in, in, the, in the talk that Heather gave yesterday, which was so good uh, that at 2, p 2 a.m. today morning, I got up and started redoing my slides because I don't need to explain everything in great detail anymore because her story and the fact that she had the slide behind her uh, kind of explained uh, the principles. But I'm just going to show them and spend like 
a, a sentence on each, just reminding ourselves. But the story of Nacy, the zero to 60 miles per hour story of Nacy, the way Heather presented it yesterday, already should have taught you the principles. So let's, this is just a very quick review session. So you have the bird in hand principle, which basically says that already you have enough things within your control that you can get started on changing the world or changing your own future, right? So it's a mindset that looks at uh, scarcity and sees resources. Kind of don't, don't think about all the things you don't have, just think about the things you already have and begin with that. Um, and then the affordable loss principle suggests to you that if you can keep the bottom, the downside within your control, so you will never actually, you kind of look the worst possible case in the face and say, this is the worst possible case I am willing to live with. So if you can somehow take control of the downside, then you're free to go out and push the upside, right? And so the idea is to say, work always uh, with, uh, invest more, no more than what you can afford to lose. Make sure you shore up the downside and keep it within your control. Um, and the way you can actually just start with things with already within your control and shore up the downside and yet push is you bring other people on board. And other people doesn't mean that they have to be all billionaires or, you know, these people we chase who we be believe have resources and power without whom we cannot get anything done. In some ways it could be true, but even to get there, the expert entrepreneurs tell you you have to first find the people who already want to work with you, right? There is less than six degrees of separation between us and Bill Gates. And we know that from social network research, but we don't live that way. And the experienced entrepreneurs say, you know, when you just think about the people who will pass the choose me test, right, who actually want to be part of your project, don't worry about whether they have wallets, whether they have power, start working with them. And as you grow your network, you will get to the people you need to get to. Of course, I don't want to give the idea that this is all kumbaya, right? Life has a way of throwing lemons at you. And uh, so the, uh, you have to think about the fact that you are going to have negative as well as positive experiences. But what the expert entrepreneurs learn is simply to say that even when something negative happens, because you have all these other principles working for you, there are ways to turn some of those into opportunities. In, in many, many cases, people have turned really difficult things into opportunities, and it's fascinating to understand how they do that. At the heart of all of that is, of course, the idea that the future is not something out there that we have to somehow figure out and go on a treasure hunt and uh, you know, be extremely smart and well endowed to do it. No, the future is something that you and I, to the extent that we actually are willing to lose something, but not, it's only, it has to be affordable loss, and we go out there and push and work with the people who want to work with us, the future can actually be co-created. So this is kind of my little review um, uh, from the story that you heard from Heather yesterday. And if you put it together over time, you can see how this actually works to create ventures, whether the ventures are for profit or, so or non-profit or anything else, or solve a big social problem. So you start with who I am, what I know, and whom I know. That's all, things already within your control. You start thinking about what are some things that I can do for affordable laws, that might actually create some value. That might actually create something that I actually want to do. And almost the first thing you start doing is you start interacting with other people. And with every interaction, interaction, you're trying to get some kind of skin in the game from the other person. Not necessarily for your vision alone, right? You're actually trying to get them to be part of their vision of your idea their vision of things that you can do. But every single time somebody says, okay, you know, I'm willing to work with you if you can do this or if we can work on this other thing that I care about and here is how we can work together. Every time that happens, 
you get a you know, kind of a co-created cycle, an expanding cycle of resources, and the whole venture becomes about who we are, what we know, and whom we know. But as I mentioned, it also means that you're bringing in another person's aspirations, their view of uh, what the future is or what the future should be, and you, ha you have to figure out how to work together with that. And so to some extent, um, it pre creates some kind of constraints and begins to shape the clay of today um, in some interesting ways so that it can be transformed into something beautiful in the future. But it, it is done together. And along the way, of course, come some surprises that will impact both your burden hand and, in your, and your affordable law. So this is not a static story. This is something that happens over and over and over again. And if you notice in this particular uh, cycle diagram, right? Every person is investing only what they can afford to lose. And nobody might actually know what the final product is going to look like. But if things go wrong, nobody loses more than they afford to lose, more, more than they can afford to lose. And this is why that this process is, A, very likely to lead to something new, to kind of a novelty, innovations of some kind, but it also keeps the costs of failure down. So it increases the probability of innovation if you succeed and reduces the costs of failure if you fail. Um, so this is kind of the academic uh, summary of it. Now let us do what we do, right? Let us go uh, into the classroom. What happens when you take this stuff into the classroom? So one of the things that you hit immediately, and this might happen not just in the classroom, it might happen if you go into your dean's office, right? Uh, it happens in other situations as well. Uh, but let's just stick with the classroom for a moment, right? So every time you bring this, these ideas, people immediately say, uh, you know, but I can't. I would love to be an entrepreneur. I would love to do this, but, you know, and you get that. So I thought I'll tackle that a little bit. When you start talking to your students, when you talk, uh, start talking to your stakeholders, what makes this thing a little bit difficult to do, right? We're talking about doing the doable, and yet people find it difficult to do it. Let's take a look at each principle from that perspective. So what happens? When we say, oh, I can work with things, you know, that are within my control. But the fact is we dream big, right? We have wholesale ambition. We imagine a world you know, that is poverty free or something. And it looks like whatever we come up with that we can do seems very small. It seems very retail and people get demoralized. So, so that's why the effectual entrepreneurs are learning the lesson that don't just start with a big dream and don't underestimate the importance of retail action, right? So the thing is, it's okay to dream a bit, but keep your specific goals a little bit more open. It's okay to wake up in the morning and say, I want to create a poverty-free world, poverty world, but don't think that you can sit in bed and figure out the way you know, to create the, and then until you are convinced that this is the perfect way, you don't act, right? That's what this principle is actually telling, and that's very difficult to do. So I'm not going to give you answers on how you address these uh, issues, but this is the task in front of us, to educate people to say, you know that action is worthwhile even if you do not know for sure uh, that you can actually solve. The inspiration is important, but the action is crucial. Let's look at affordable loss here. What happens here? Again, a lot of people get excited by the upside, right? They start calculating how good it would be if I could achieve this kind of thing. And they don't want to think about failure at all. They, want, they don't want to think about the downside at all. And the experienced entrepreneurs learn the opposite. They say, if you can face the downside in the mirror and you still know you can live with it, and in spite of that you still want to do something, now that's a good enough criterion that it's worth doing. You don't have to create an entire poverty-free world. But you say, I will do this particular project 
And even if this project doesn't work out, it's worthwhile for me to try it. That's a good way to select projects. It makes you think about economic and non-economic upside in a very, very different way because you have faced in the mirror what the downside possibilities are. Now think about you know, the crazy quilt principle. There are some real issues with that, right? This time, it's not just that you're focused on the upside or downside, but you have this. Students are always, you know, they're always telling me the story of the entrepreneur as this persistent uh, uh, hero, the lone visionary who can see something no, nobody else can see. The rest of the world is idiots. And, you know, we have to do this and I have to do this at any cost, you know, that kind of thing. And at the same time, paradoxically, they all constantly worry about the loss of control, right? If you are such a visionary hero and you do not care about the world, then why are you afraid of working with other people? Because you are the right, you are right. And it turns out that in their mind, it's actually logically linked, right? If I'm the only person who can see it, that means nobody else can see it. So uh, if I bring other people on, they're somehow, you know, going to um, adulterate, you know, <laughs> stain my vision or something. So they have this idea that you have to do it your way. And as I said, most of my students have never heard the Frank Sinatra song, but, you know, they all buy it for some reason. Uh, and, and then the lemonade is kind of a, a very easy one because a lot of people, all of us do this. When bad things happen, it's kind of very difficult to wake up that next morning and see opportunity in it. That is not an easy thing to do. With the lemonade principle, we are actually talking about some negative things happening in life, whether it's failure or whatever. So that's a tough one for everybody, definitely uh, for uh, students who might be thinking about the future in a very kind of path-dependent way. They want to follow a career path. They want safety. And they keep thinking all the things that could go wrong. Um, and they do not see that there could be opportunity in some of those things actually going wrong. And we come, finally, to what I call Steve Jobs. Uh, <laughs> and this is the Steve Jobs syndrome. So I'm very glad uh, Ed Massey brought up uh, Steve Jobs. I'm going to talk about him in a minute. So here it's basically seeing that the future comes from, you know, that you co-create the future, which means you have to work with other people, which means you have to ask other people for help. Right? You're not this bright, visionary, lone hero who's going to be able to convince everybody to come on board. You don't have tons of money. You don't have power. And the question really is, how do you go out and co-create with other people? How do you depend on other people in some ways? So my students keep bringing up this uh, issue. Oh, but Steve Jobs, you know, wouldn't ask anybody. Steve Jobs knows. He even knows what the market needs. And so they just have this, what I call the Steve Jobs syndrome. So I was like trying to fight this in class and trying to explain uh, until, of course, another student solved the problem, thanks to the internet. And the students basically sent me a video. So let's let Steve Jobs you know, speak for himself. Now, I've actually always found something uh, to be very true, which is um, most people don't get those experiences because they never ask. Uh, I've never found anybody that didn't want to help me if I asked them for help. I always call them up. I called up, um, this will date me, but I called up Bill Hewlett when I was 12 years old, and he lived in Palo Alto. His number was still in the phone book. And he answered the phone himself. He said, yes? He said, hi, I'm Steve Jobs. I'm 12 years old. I, I'm a, a student in high school, and I want to build a frequency counter. And I was wondering if you had any spare parts I could have. And he laughed, and he, he gave me the spare parts to build this frequency counter, and he gave me a job that summer in Hewlett-Packard, working on the assembly line, putting nuts and bolts together on frequency counters. He got me a job in the place that built them. And I was in heaven. And I've never found anyone who said no or hung up the phone when I call, I just asked. And when people ask me, I try to be as responsive, you know, to pay that, that debt of gratitude back. Um, most people never pick up the phone and call. Most people never ask. And that's what separates sometimes the people that do things from the people that just dream about them. You've got you to act. And you've got to be uh, willing to 
uh, fail. You've got to be willing to crash and burn. You know, with people on the phone, with starting a company, with whatever. If you're afraid of failing, uh, you won't get very far. So what do I mean by asking? So in the last few years, we have been focusing in on trying to understand how can you practice effectuation, all the principles, uh, if you're a novice entrepreneur or somebody who's never tried entrepreneurial method before. Uh, and the ask became the unit of the analysis. And there are some interesting things about asking, right? It's not just going out and asking for money, the normal sense of the word, right? Or asking for resources. This is really getting engaged with other people, listening very carefully, being empathic, and through that, through that, let possibilities emerge. So a lot of time, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time yesterday kind of thinking about this and practicing it in the masterclass workshop. So um, just to get us going on that a little bit without getting into all the details of the research and the stuff that we have learned through the ask, I just want to tell you a story of an ask, right? Most of you might have known this story. This is a story of Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, uh, which has uh, kind of one of the earliest microfinance uh, organizations that kickstarted the entire microfinance industry to some extent. The founder of Grameen Bank, Mohammed Yunus, won the Nobel Peace Prize. And now, of course, microfinance is so successful that you know, everybody disses it. Uh, and that's all right, too. Uh, but when Mohammed Yunus got started with Grameen Bank, the story, the zero to 60 miles per hour story is kind of interesting. And it has all the principles of effectuation as you would expect it. So I'm going to go rather fast on that, right? So here's an economist who returns from the U.S. Uh, to his home country, Bangladesh, and does what an economist does, collects data. He's an agriculture economist. So he's Chittagong University, but collects data in rural areas. And there's a natural disaster after which he kind of realizes that for the amount equivalent of about $27, uh, he could save 45 uh, livelihoods. And just like you and me, he says, okay, I have the money. He gives the money to the people. And it turns out that you know, they not only use the money to revitalize their livelihood, but they bring, the, bring back the money and bring him some rice and fish as well. And as an economist, he starts wondering, why aren't banks doing this? I mean, this seems like a simpler way than all the stuff that we do to try to get people out uh, uh, of the economic misery after a disaster. Why don't we just lend them money and have them develop their own livelihoods? And then, of course, he goes to the bank, and the bankers laugh at him, and they basically tell him, oh, but these are poor people. They are unbankable. The amount of the loan uh, is you know, smaller than the fees we would charge to process the loan application. So this cannot be done. And so Mohamed Yunus thinks, okay, maybe I can, uh, you know, form a little organization and we start going from village to village uh, and we'll try to do this just as a nonprofit. And he begins to do it and it goes to the next village, it works, it goes to, and he starts learning along the way what it takes for people to become part of this organization, what it takes and he learns things like if you give the money to the women, it comes back with rice and fish. If you, don't, if you give the money to the men, not so much. Uh, <laughs> moreover, if you give it to the woman, you can see the entire family kind of getting prosperous within the next year or so. It's kind of, it's, it becomes really visible. So they come up with these models of how you know, Grameen should actually lend, how this thing should work. They have all the details worked out. And then they realize that once they move out of like two or three villages that they know of, they hit a huge problem. And the problem is that there is a taboo in Bangladesh, which for centuries it says women should not touch money. I mean, literally, physically not touch it. And now this seems like the kind of problem where we give up, you know, these ignorant, you know, superstitious, whatever, religious, uh, and uh, so how, how do we solve this problem, right? It's time to go back and be an academic at that point in time. Turns out that the people at Grameen and Yunus thought, why don't ask people? Like, what is the problem? Why can't she touch money? 
And so they went and started talking to husbands. And it turned out it was not any of those things. I mean, these people are poor, illiterate, maybe even superstitious, but they are smart. And the smart answer they received was actually that people said, you are saying you are going to come and give money to this woman who has never even touched money, and you are saying that she is somehow going to do something and repay it. It just sounds like a scam to me. All I'm going to do is the age-old problem. I'm going to fall into indebtedness. I'm going to end up owing the money. I don't need this. Go away. Right? So, and so then they said, oh my God, that makes sense. <laughs> right? And so they asked them, what would convince you? What would it take for you to at least let us try this? And so some of the men started saying, you know, give us in writing that I don't have to repay the loan that you're giving her, right? So they actually created this reverse contract, <laughs> knocked on people's doors and offered them, you know, uh, this reverse contract of saying you do not have to repay this loan. And that's what it took. It took 15 years, but every time one or two people would sign on, you, the magic would happen, and the neighbors would see this family actually is coming out of it, and so they built the model. Um, I just wanted you to think about this idea of effectuation that many people in the room are already familiar with and have read and are teaching and even developing teaching materials. And then think about this little word, ask, and think about how we can actually use that word to solve the problems that I listed, that the students come up with on why they cannot do each of the five principles. So that I'm going to leave as a task uh, for you. So let me just put this together so you can see this, right? So, so you think about the seven million women entrepreneurs in Grameen Bank, and you think about the principles, and you say, how do you link all of these together? It's something very, very simple. It's the notion of the ask, right? So um, I, I'm assuming we still have the 15 minutes. So in the spirit of co-creation, uh, here's a little surprise uh, that we have come up with. And it's not a bad surprise. Uh, it's actually a good one, so I'm not calling it a lemonade uh, thing. So yesterday when we taught the master class and uh, um, some of the aspects of the ask, we, uh, we requested, we asked actually <laughs> the participants if they would like to come up here and make an ask in front of you. Right? Because one of the things about asking here, it's not like pitching. You don't need elaborate you know, preparation and things like that. So let's go very quickly. What's the difference between a pitch and an ask? Everybody knows what a pitch is, right? So uh, you decide what you want to do based on the opportunity, this big solution that you have. You decide what resources you need. You kind of figure out who has those resources, and you figure out a way to convince them to give you those resources, right? The ask is kind of the opposite. It says, just start with what you can do based on your own means and affordable laws. So, you, so people who come up here and ask you, they don't really need you, right? They're going to do this anyway. But you also want to bring other people on board, right? And the way you do it is to just ask anybody and everybody you meet and to ask openly. There's no huge quid pro quo. You're not convincing them. You're not selling them in the normal sense of the word. You're really asking for people to self-select into the process, right? And then you craft a variety of asks. Even when people are not saying yes to your ask, you learn a lot about human behavior. You learn a lot about co-creation, and you learn a lot about what is going to take to build a value, but you learn through building the value. That's what happens there. But the most important thing is you're open to working with others and to co-create. So in the spirit of effectuation, and co I'm co-creating my own keynote speech here by <laughs> asking people to come up um, and make an ask in front of you. So let's begin with the ask. There are four colleges who have signed up, and we have told them that they can have three minutes total, a couple of minutes to introduce uh, themselves and uh, uh, the projects or ideas on which they're going to make the ask, tell you a little bit about yesterday's class learnings as well, and then they have 30 seconds to actually make the ask. And remember, you are, this is not a spectator sport. 
So you are all going to practice this with them. So I request you to take out your mobile phones or laptops or whatever you have, because when each group comes up here and makes their ask in 30 seconds, their email address and phone number will be on the slide. And I would like for you, only if you wish, to self-select into the process by within that 30 seconds, letting them know you want to participate, that you want to help, maybe in specific, specific ways, or maybe in general ways, or maybe in empathic ways where you say, you take a little bit of ownership and say, I am willing to work with you, but here is how I would like to work with you. So whatever, if you just want to say yes, if you want uh, for a, something specific, if you want to say I want to be part of this in a very general way, or if you have something specific that you want, a counter offer, a counter ask, if you will, that's all right. So whatever it is, you have to work, so get your phones and laptops ready, uh, get your cards ready. Uh, if you don't have either phone or laptop, so that you can actually approach the group and give it to them afterwards. So, if everybody is ready, everybody is ready. I want to hear a yes. <laughs> Let's invite the first group. Seminole State College of Florida, come on up. And you really have to appreciate them. We didn't give them much time. They, I don't think they might have even heard of this word. They definitely hadn't heard any of the ask stuff that we talked about yesterday till yesterday. So I want to give them a hand just for coming up. Hopefully this took care of Remember, it does not matter. It doesn't matter, okay. It does not matter. I need a million right? dollars in my bank account by it's tomorrow. It's affordable loss for you. What's the worst that's going to happen? All right. Everybody's going to clap. Okay. You heard that? Everybody's going to clap whether you like it or not. We could practice that. Ladies and gentlemen and board of trustees. Oh, sorry, that was me preparing for my next ask. My name is Hugh Moore, and I brought with me my colleague, David Meridian. We're from Seminole State College of Florida, and we have 32,000 students. I'm the associate dean overseeing the Center for Business Disciplines, legal studies, which grounds me, and entrepreneurship. David is the program manager for entrepreneurship. We came here last year. We discovered in our own business discussions with our advisories that the spirit of innovation, the spirit of entrepreneurship, was growing. So we started to feed that back into our programs, and we also created an entrepreneurship program. I'm pleased to say that in the fall of 2013, we started an entrepreneurship program. We attained 55 students. This year, fall of 2014, we're over 300 students, and we're gonna graduate some of them this fall. So what do we have as a bird in the hand? We're building that crazy quilt. We have tr tremendous students. We have very responsive students. They're non-traditional. Some of them are in business already, learning better skills. Some have failed in their businesses and can teach more in the classroom than we can, and we're gonna go wild with this. We have great faculty. David is one of them. David is the program manager for the entrepreneurship business. Our community advisory, talking about building the crazy quilt, are crazy. They want to be in our classrooms. They want to be teaching our president, yes. And they want to be telling us how to do our businesses, but they want to be part of it. It's grown tremendously. So I want to go global. I think the myopic side of students and ourselves is dangerous. We need to go global. So our ask is along that line. And with that, I'd like to introduce David Meridian, our program manager for entrepreneurship. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me that opportunity to ask and ask for help. I'm not asking for money. I never asked for money. Some individuals, they did, but I'm not. Uh, some of the work we did on the international and globally, uh, I've done trips to Turkey, Germany, uh, Iran, Pakistan, Portugal, and we are trying to make some kind of collaboration with other schools in other parts of the world that they are hungry and they have the thirst for the knowledge that we provide in the US. Not all the countries and all the universities and all college students, they are as blessed as the ones in the US. Therefore, 
we kind of pitching for help, and we are asking uh, two items. One, please text me or email me. My email and the phone number is on the uh, board. Name, name yourself or an organization that is willing to help us expand the international arena. And the second part is, do you want to get involved globally expanding in other countries as well? If so, you just email me and we get it uh, going. Something that I learned a couple days ago, I watch TV a lot and I go to movies. I have a son and a wife and therefore I have to take them to movies and get them busy. But I watched um, this program, it said, you know, there's a lot of knowledge in this room and there's a lot of collab collaboration, but knowledge and collaboration without action is hallucination. So we do not want to get hallucinated, but we want to collaborate and put it in action. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, how awesome is that? I'm going to give you 30 seconds so you can actually text, phone, email, and then I'll call the next group. <laughs> if nothing, take paper and pen, and there's plenty of paper and pen. Write it down, huh, if the net is down. <laughs> All right, we'll call the next one. This is wonderful that in an effectual keynote, you can actually stand silent for a few seconds. All right, here we go. Eastern New Mexico University, Roswell. Where are you? Oh, come on, come on over. I forget I have to stand in front of the mic. They already kind of co-opted me as a self-selected stakeholder. I stand with them. <laughs> Every kind of stuff. The boys' choir. The boys' choir. <laughs> there you go. Oh, you need girls. That's right. That's right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Madden. It's my privilege to be the president of Eastern New Mexico University in Roswell, New Mexico where you can get an education that's out of this world. <laughs> our, our, journey our journey started about three or four years ago. Uh, we are a heavily Hispanic institution. I'll explain our institution more in a minute. Uh, and applied for a Title V grant that did three projects. Kind of like the old Title Threes, you gotta do three projects. And the last project was to create an entrepreneurship program. And quite frankly, uh, we submitted the grant under a very difficult deadline with, with uh, Jim Engelhardt's help. And I didn't, I didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> so since it was our third project in on Title V, I thought, well, we'll get to it when we get to it. Uh, last year, uh, some of the gentlemen behind me decided to go to, thank you, decided to go to a meeting called NAC or NACI or something like that, and they wanted me to go, and I, oh well, I'll, I'll put that off till later. Uh, this year they persuaded me and twisted my arm to come here, uh, twisted it pretty hard this time, and, I, and I'm sure glad they did. Uh, you are the right people, and we are in the right place for what we need, and I appreciate your being here. Sarah's convinced us yesterday to be guinea pigs, uh, to get up here and talk about our, our college and our needs. Our college is a small, relatively small rural college in southeastern New Mexico. We are a heavily impoverished area. We are a heavily educated, undereducated area, and we are a physically isolated area. It is 200 miles to the nearest town of 100,000 people. All that has led to us having an issue with change, entrepreneurial change, any kind of change. Uh, the mantra at our particular institution is, we've always done it that way. I'm sure you're familiar with it. So here comes the ask. <laughs> We have got a fantastic opportunity for all of you out there. We are looking for a mentor partner 
to assist us in bringing an entrepreneurial spirit to our college culture. Someone who has successfully made this transition and can share their wisdom with us. By assisting us, you will hone your own skills in teaching what you know, participate in a chronicling of this effort, and perhaps presenting at NACI 2015. Keenan, Keenan there, there you go. And most importantly, plant another seed of entrepreneurship in a rural community college. In order to, we also commit to you that in order to honor your commitment, we will pay this forward and share what we have learned with two more rural community colleges. Our contact information is on the screen. Please contact us, and we thank you in advance for your help. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, a few seconds for action. And I just realized Sarah, who without her I wouldn't, I don't, I don't know what I would do. She's so organized. She has little cards there that actually tells you the time. So the la I should have made that announcement. So the last two groups, at least you know there is, you know how much time you have. So you can take a look at her. And one of the, I'm so short I cannot see you. <laughs> I have to do this. <laughs> All right. Shall we bring the next group? Okay. Feather River College, where are you? Come on over. Do you want me standing with you? Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. All right. So we have a new norm. <laughs> okay. Good morning, AC friends. My name is Amy Schultz, and I'm the Director for Career Technical Education and Economic Workforce Development at Feather River College. And my name is Leah Gould Haas. I'm the Deputy Sector Navigator of Global Trade and Logistics for the Far Northern California region. Together, we represent the new world of work at Feather River College. <laughs> Um, the new world of work is the impending massive workforce shift that we're all about to experience, if we haven't already. The U.S. Department of Labor uh, predicts that by 2020, 50% of the workforce will be contingent, meaning that half of the workforce will be entrepreneurial. They'll be freelancers, consultants, um, and traditional business owners. Our concern is how do we prepare our current students for the workforce they are entering? And so we have done a lot of research at Feather River College through the new world of work to identify these trends and also to identify methodologies um, for how to prepare our workforce. This is not a coming workforce trend. This is an, an existing global reality. reality. Yesterday, we were struck by how the effectuation method mirrors how the new world of work at Feather River College is preparing our students for the workforce we are entering. The effectuation method can be applied on an individual level, and this is the process that the new world of work is engaged in with our students. As the NACI community, we are already leaders at infusing entrepreneurial mindset in, across education. And so our ask today is to ask the NACI community to encourage NACI leadership to include the new world of work as a priority NACI initiative to train all students um, across all disciplines in the entrepreneurial mindset to be prepared for the new world of work. Your call to action today is to support this. So first of all, um, let NACI leadership know that you are interested in learning more um, through our conferences, through the journal, through um, convenings with each other. Um, if you would like to learn more about it, we are actually presenting a breakout tomorrow at 945 in the Buga Villa room on future casting. But your call to action is to get involved, learn more, and um, be advocates for your students for the world they're entering into. If you have questions, and we don't have, oh, we do have our number up there. So you can text um, Leah at that number. Also, our Twitter handle is new, N-E-W, um, W-O-W, so for world of work, underscore F-R-C. 
Um, and we're also all over the NACI Twitter account, so um, feel free to jump on there as well. So thank you so much for your time today. Good job. All right, a few seconds. If you don't have uh, a way to text or a phone, just write down the number, please. Okay, shall I go there? So the, the last um, ask for today on the podium, but I'm hoping that the spirit is going to uh, be with you and you're going to begin practicing your asks, but also beginning, you know, going up and uh, becoming a self-selected stakeholder to some people and asking people of what are the kinds of things you're trying to do. I, I hope you're going to do more of that. So just the last ask on the podium. Prairie State College, where are you? Okay, come on over. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Terry Winfrey. I'm the president of Prairie State College. Prairie State College is located about 30 miles south of Chicago in what we affectionately call the Chicago Southland region. It's known for manufacturing. Good morning, I'm Craig Schmidt, the Vice President of Community and Economic Development. And I'm Lisa Ziegler, I'm the Grant Manager, and we're here today to ask for your help. I'm sure many of you colleges face the same issue. Manufacturers are coming to us and telling us that they have a significant number of employees that are scheduled to retire. However, they're concerned because they don't, are not finding qualified individuals, interested individuals in the pipeline so that they can replace the retired employees. So we at Prairie State are working to educate and provide experiences for parents, youth, and students to learn about innovative and meaningful careers in manufacturing. And our resolution to this is a maker lab. It is, <laughs> all right. <laughs> it is, it's space, it's software, and it's equipment that allows students, entrepreneurs, businesses, hobbyists, and artists access to resources in starting a business and to make physical products using CNC machines, welding equipment, and 3D printers. For the Maker's Lab, today we're going to talk about three of the effectual principles we learned about yesterday. Bird in hand, co-creation, otherwise known as the crazy quilt, and the pilot in plane. Yes, Dr. Lambert, we want the, the pilot there. <laughs> At Prairie State College, we have a 1,200 square foot space identified. We also have the support and excitement of administrators, faculty, and staff. And this is co-creation of the region, and we have one heck of a crazy quilt. We have local grade schools and high schools that are, will help us get young people interested in manufacturing and in entrepreneurship. We have Prairie State College faculty that will include this in their curriculum. We have local businesses to, that they can use this to develop new prototypes and increase their patents. We have local entrepreneurs that will provide them access to equipment, experts, and other resources. We have a huge number of partners. We have regional chambers of commerce and convention and visitors bureaus. We have manufacturing associations, the regional economic development corporations, managers and mayors associations, and we have a unique consortium that includes 12 public and private colleges and universities. So we ask for you to be involved in our Maker's Lab. We have transitioned that from local artists, or excuse me, from manufacturing to include even local artists who can expand their creativity. Junior high students to learn about the endless potential opportunities, budding entrepreneurs to play in the lab and create that prototype. Our ask, we ask that you become, all of you, attendees and sponsors become involved in this exciting opportunity for entrepreneurial spirit. We're looking for printers, equipment, financial assistant, human capital. You all have time and talent. How do you see yourself involved? Please see us. Let us know how you can be involved. Thank you. We couldn't have asked for a better way to end this keynote uh, than the Maker Lab, 
right? Because it's all about making the future. So all I can say is go do it. Thank you.